Well, hello there, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages. My name is Dogbot53, and welcome to Hard Run for New Order Last Days of Europe. Now, last time we hopped into some good old TNO, we hopped in as the Western Siberian nation of Omsk and led the Black League from a small runt state from a fallen Soviet Union into the dominant power over the Russian region. And ultimately, spoiler alert, the ultimate force that led to the end of the world. Um, that was nice and fun. Um, nice we did, got to do one of the sub goals. Well, speaking of sub goals, um, we're trying to get to 1,000 subs. And as soon as we get, hit 1,000 subs, we're doing uh, Tabaritsky. So if you want to see the funny clock man, hit the sub button and try to get us up to 1K subs. Uh, so yeah, if you're interested in that. Yeah, go ahead and uh, hit the sub button. But that's in the future. Right now, we're going to hop into a good old game of Tino once more. We can see, yep, there's uh, the old save game from uh, what happens if uh, nuclear armor again happens. And we're going back into Russia once again. We're doing a lot of Russia games as of late because uh kind of want to save more of the major nations for uh, Cutting Room Floor whenever that's coming out. Which, they're, they're not being the most forthcoming about, but um, it'll, it'll come eventually. I'm not, I'm not worried about that. So we're going to a region that we have not played before for the YouTube channel. The far east of Siberia. More specifically, we're hopping into Magadan. Led by Mikhail Mikovsky, a fascist fella. Leader of the Russian Fascist Party, or one of the branches of it at least. Since the birth of the Russian Fascist Party, Mikhail Mikovsky competed with Konstantin Rodzevsky for control. Rodzevsky was aggressive and idealistic and openly supported Hitler's Nazism, while Mikovsky was more subtle and diplomatic and saw the racial hatred for the Nazis held for Russians plainly. The two men often butted heads, but worked well for the dream of a Russia free from Bol Bolshevism. When the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union, that dream suddenly became a reality, as the RFP organized an invasion of the Russian Far East. However, Rodovsky's refusal to denounce National Socialism, even as the Nazis carried out a genocide against the Russian people, was a breaking point for Mikovsky. He knew that Germany would never tolerate a strong Russia, even a fascist one, and Rodovsky was only leading the nation towards suicide. Mikovsky and his supporters took control over the port of Maginan and declared that Rodzevsky was a traitor to the motherland, and that only Mikovsky would be able to reunite Russia under true fascism. Mikovsky's clique has now spent five years preparing to strike south and finish Rodzevsky once and for all. Resources in Maginan are scarce, forcing Mikovsky to turn to unusual sources of help. Mercenaries from all over the world have come to Maginan seeking fame and fortune, but the greatest source of support Port, lies across the Pacific, the United States. Persuading the Americans will be no easy task, but if anyone can do it, it is Metkovsky. So we're going to go ahead and select the country. We'll scroll out a little bit. I think I was debating whether I wanted to uh, unequip this texture pack and go with the base game uh, textures, but I, I think we'll go with the uh, visual map pack that we have and just keep it going. Is there anything we want to fuck around with? In uh, custom settings, I don't think there really is. I don't think so. No, I guess I'll just see if they add anything at all. But it doesn't look like it. Yeah, doesn't look like it. I don't mean, like minor little events. It seems. Yeah, we'll go ahead and start this game and get into it. I'll go ahead and start my timer along with that. And let us hop into Magadan. Any second now. Come on, game. You can do it. I believe in you. You can do it. Mm -hmm. 
At least we got the jams to jam out to. Good old Burgundian lullaby. Oh, there we are. Once, Mikhail Mikhailovsky was an enthusiastic member of the Russian Fascist Party. Within the exiled community of Harbin, few still held any reverence for the old guards of the white movement, the old men that had lost Russia to the hands of the Reds. Fascism, a modern ideology, a rejection of decadent liberalism and natural socialism, seemed to Mikhailovsky the way forward. Russia would be made strong. Once the Soviet Union inevitably crumbled, the true heirs of Harbin would come forth from the Japanese Manchuria and begin the Great Crusade to liberate Russia. Konstantin Rodzevsky brought doubt to Metkovsky's mind. The so-called Volst of the Russian Fascist Party was an amoral brute. His associates jumped up thugs, men of no caliber, and the refuse, the refuse of the Russian communion Harbin. When Germany invaded Russia, brutalizing its people, the RFP's leaders wrote sycophantic letters of praise to the men who despoiled Russia. No. Rozovsky would not be trusted to save Russia. And so Mikhailovsky began to plot. With the help of Nikolai, Nikolai Petlin, a man known in Harbin for his ties to the russo american community, Mikhailovsky waited. The opportunity of a lifetime came in the late 50s. He go to his pathetic Soviet remnants, launched a feudal war to conquer the cent Central Siberian Republic. The strain of fighting broke down both nations, leading the white commune Harbin free to strike. The invasion broke the back of Yagoda's state, liberating Chita, Amor, and Magadan. In this moment of triumph for the RFP, Mikhailovsky enacted his plan. The port city of Magadan was seized, along with a great deal of the RFP's invasion force. Rozevsky's thugs were pushed back to Amor, deprived of the critical port of Magadan. In Magadan, the true leader of the RFP awaits. There is much work to be done. Remain Rodzevsky loyalists must be purged. Foreign contacts must be reached, and critical supplies of weapons and mercenaries must be brought in. But Kovsky's path ahead remains long and hard. Nevertheless, he presses on. Only he has the strength to, raise your, to save Russia from its anarchy. So we can appeal to America's white emigrate community to garner support and ensure Mikhailovsky's success. We can deal with a mad Vost in Amor and the decrepit white junta in Chita to unite the Far East against Bolshevism. And we can begin the reunification of Russia under the true Vost. Onwards. So let's take a look at what we got. Excuse me, I had to get some, uh, get some more water. So. We're led by Mikhail Mikhailovsky, who has uh, the Vosd of Russia, which gives us a recovery rate of 10%. Vosd, Vosd, I'm not sure how you say it, so um, if someone wants to correct me, please do. In so many ways, Mikhail Alexevich Mikhailovsky displays a form of Russian fascism that contrasts itself against Rodzevsky's formulation. Will Rodzevsky is dogmatic, he is pragmatic. Will Rodzevsky is a skilled, fiery orator. He is the negotiator, using his tact and political acumen to sway political enemies to his side. Rodzevsky praised the anti-Semitic initiatives from the black shirts, and Kolpsky despised their thuggery. For a brief moment, their goals aligned. The results of their cooperation saw the membership of the RFP rise and peak, as more and more Russian emigres saw the appeal of fascism. Then the Great Patriotic War erupted. With the Germans waging a conflict of extermination upon Russia, the differences between these two simmered. Despite Hitler's destructive genocidal intent, Rodzevsky sought his support, dreaming of a Russia free from Bolshevism at last. Mikhailovsky had no such illusions. Germany's war against the Soviet Union and therefore against Russia lay bare the racial hatred for Russians. No matter what the appeal the RFP could garner, the Nazis did not factor any independent Russia into their plans. However, true in Mikhailovsky's tact, he and his clique remained silent and bided their time, growing their power in the intervening years. When the time came, they seized the city of Magadan from Rodzevsky, driving the loyals out and officially splitting the party. Now in charge of his own domain, Mikhailovsky seeks to save Russia from her ruin. This means, to, the e to this end, lay across the ocean, past the Japanese, America. However, even for an experienced negotiator such as Mikhailovsky, convincing any foreign power is a difficult task. Yet, he will not let mere doubt stop him. So let's go ahead and take a look at our national spirits. We have the hairs of Harbin, which we share with Cheetah and Amor. 
In the aftermath of the Russian Civil War, the remainder of the White Army retreated into Harbin as exiles, nursing their wounds and plotting the overthrow of the Soviet Union. Before long, however, fascism coalesced within the city. Under the leadership of Rozevsky and Matkovsky, the RFP soon became the premier party of Russian emigres. As the Union collapsed, the Whites and the RFP formed a united front from against the Bolsheviks and, for a time, they were successful, until infighting split them apart. Now the three slint splinters vie for power, each claiming to be the rightful heir of Harbin. Coming from there, we have Fascist Splinters, which gives us a bit of a group population, some attack, and some recovery E-rate bonuses, which is not bad. Long ago, the Russian Fascist Party was a unified organization, free from civil strife that plagued everything in Russia. However, this unity did not last long. The doctrinal differences that divided its two heads, Rodzevsky and Mikovsky, had simmered for years, perhaps for decades. Falling came into a head when Mikovsky seized the port town of Magadan for his own use. He promises a free Russia, an unshackled Russia, a Russia liberated from shames of suffering and poverty. Only time will tell if his promise holds. So not bad, not bad. We have the gateway into Russia, which gives us a pretty negligible political power bonus and a bit of a trade factor, deal opinion factor, which not too bad. Beyond mere circumstance, the Vos had a specific intent when he chose Magadan to launch our struggle. The shores of his icy Pacific port bring many blessings. Smugglers from Kamchatka and Alaska alike carry great boons to be processed in the city every day. The Vos government grows from the hub's riches, and in turn, so does our legitimacy. And then finally, we have the port of Magadan, which gives us some dockyard output, some dockyard construction speed, and some trade convoy production cost. Not bad overall. One of the most important port cities in Siberia, Magadan is a well-known as a gateway into the region for all the countries of the world, and possesses considerable shipbuilding facilities besides. Control the port ensures that ship construction will be completed in rapid fashion. Very, very nice. So our liter literacy is going down, so is our poverty rate. Army professionalism too, man. We got a lot of disgruntled veterans. It's not looking too nice, I gotta say. Our head of government is Vladimir Kibardin. Our foreign minister is Nikolai Petlin. Our economic minister is Vladimir Goltsov. And our security minister is Alexander Pavlov. Probably, I apologize if I butchered any of those. Um, these guys don't matter so much. It's this guy who's going to be a bit of more, a uh, bit more interesting. So keep an eye out on him. Before we continue on with any story stuff, let's take a look at the research and get working on that. I'll hold off on getting the new guns immediately, actually. We'll get working on some tube computing. And... Civilian construction. That'll do fine. We have one factory. Might as well build some rifles. We have unassigned divisions. We got, what, three? Yeah, three boys right here. Put them in an army. Field Marshal will go with Alexander Pavlov. For generals, we'll go with Yuri Vitvitsky. Vitvivsky. Something like that. Hopefully I'm not wrong. I don't know. I might be. Probably am. Oh, we got uh, construction real quick, actually, too. Um... Our infrastructure is horrible, but I believe with focuses we'll be able to do this a little bit better. So we'll just, we'll max out with city factories. So eventually when our GDP, become, when GDP becomes a factor, we'll, we'll be able to work on strengthening ours. Damn it, I'm already out of water. This is not good. Uh, well, it's going to have to, un I forgot. I'm not used to this for Russia, but we actually have dockyards, so we can get working on some boats. We'll, fo we'll focus on convoys for now. There's not much else we can really put our energy towards. And with that, it's time to start with the true heir of Harbin. The Russian Fascist Party, as it was known in Harbin, is now gone. Long displeased with Rodzevsky's policies and rhetoric, Mikovsky and his wing of the party have taken control of Magadan and are molding it to suit their purposes. No longer shall the party struggle in the mud where the whole of Russia suffers. No more thuggery. 
No more rhetoric of hatred. It, Mother Russia calls us to her fold to rescue her from ruin. Before Minkowski can do his duty for his motherland, however, he must rule alone, without constraint and free of disloyalty. While he trusts his wing of the party, he must crush dissent among the ranks. Although suspected of loyalty to Rozevsky, shall find themselves purged. With his political hold over Magadan secure, Mikulski shall do his sacred duty, one that he has steeled himself to do ever since the heady days of Harbin. Under his guidance, Russia stal shall stand strong, shall stand again, so strong unrivaled. There we go. Not too shabby when we get to playing, where... At least 15 minutes in, I want to say. But hey, we can finally hit unpause. <clears throat> Mikovsky steadied his glasses against his nose, peering down at a piece of paper with rows and rows of names written all over it. A list of Rodzewski's suspected loyalists. He looked up to discover a room packed to the brim with books from his white army days. Old decaying American newspapers in the far corner, shrouded in the dark. An old gramophone gathering rust and dust. The sight of this thing brought a smirk to Mikulski's face. The old Harbin building, the dances and the parties, and above it all, the electric swastika, promising another future for the Russians stranded there. The doorbell rang, shaking Mikulski from his reverie. Two gruff men, dressed in the party uniform, entered. In a small and messy room, they stood out as an oddity, almost barbaric even. Their feet thumped loudly on the wooden floors as they attempted clumsy salutes. One lean with breezes of blonde hair peeking beneath the party cap, the other stocky with a bulge of his stomach plain to the eye. A few moments of awkward silence. Mikulski stared at them, before finally saying, Well? With trembling voices, they gave him the names of the people they had purged today. Mikulski gave them a generous smile. Thank you. You may go. While he heard the door knob latch itself close, he turned back to the list. Sergei A, Bruno B, Nicholas C. He crossed them out, dabbing the names in thick black ink, snuffing them out forever from the history of the Russian fascist party. Balancing his glass of whiskey in his hands, Mikulski looked at his reflection against a murky liquid before taking a sip. The hours went by. The doorbell rang and the men came and did their salutes, telling him of the names disappearing from the list. Sometimes when the wind was right, he could hear the crack of rifle fire somewhere deep in the woods. It was nighttime by the time he finished the list. He gently pushed the men out, thanking them for a job well done. After they left, he bolted the door behind them. Turning to his gramophone, he decided that he would dance to the memories of Harbin. He turned it on and let the good times roll. The Vols has a lot of work to do. So that's figure one, Metkovsky, the main guy who can lead uh, Russia, or Magadan, in this path. There are two others. You probably know one of the other two, because of uh, the the memes on all the wacky content. Um, but you know, Big Boss in uh, Russia, uh, Mitchell Rebel. Um, and we're not gonna be doing that path. I'll tell you guys that much right now. We're not doing um, the Soldiers Without Borders. As funny as that path is, and as hilarious it would be to do it it um it's been done by a couple guys i know uh i think mocha lover did it a few others i am i think i saw did it too so it it's a little bit overdone so i didn't want to do that so it's between metkovsky and another guy and we'll get into who that is when we get to well his little event for now let's work on building the waste because god knows we need to build these waste up news of a whore of horror drifts from the west. German terror bombings, bandit raids, and wars fought by Russians against Russians on the edges of far eastern Russia. Magadan is remote and sheltered from the troubles that plague the rest of motherland. Due to its distance, however, Magadan is not much. Located in the sparsest region of Russia, both in population and resources, there is not much here that is of use for the eventual liberation and reunion of Russia. Metkovsky will change that. The outskirts of his party shall travel the streets and outskirts of Magadan for workers willing to join him in his crusade. They will bring, 
build roads and telegram poles, small workshops and manufactories. When the day of liberation dawned upon the dark body of Russia, laid to rest by failures of the Reds and the crimes of the Germans, they shall find themselves richly rewarded by their duty and dedication. For Metkovsky shall let no faith in him go to waste. There we go. And we can do some of this stuff. And we actually can't, we don't have to hoard up on political power like uh, Omsk, that other game, that, that, that other playthrough we just did. But if, if you haven't watched this, it, it was a good one. Uh, I enjoyed Omsk. Um, fun fact, I actually recorded the, f the original first part of the, uh, of a Mogadon campaign before I did Omsk, but I started recording Omsk once I got a, Got 900 subs, and then there was a whole weird TNO drama, which I think is over. I'm not gonna get into because it seems unnecessarily toxic, and I don't, I don't want to deal with that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, I'll, I might talk about it one day, but I'm not gonna do it right now. I'll, I'll put it like that. It's not a, it's not a good place. I don't know everything. I'd have to do more research and all that shit. So I'm I'm not gonna talk about it then. So I I figured you know what I'll just come back to this another time. I'm I'm gonna finish my Omsk game because mod might be going off a workshop for a bit. I don't know what's gonna happen. And I'll just re-record this when I finish up. So here we are now. So let's get back to it. Back to rebuilding these wastes. We got tension. Oh, you have no idea, man. <clears throat> oh, this is one we've already read before. You can go ahead and read it if you haven't. And, yeah. Uh-oh, an assassin has struck at Hitler. Alexander Pavlov stood in the chilly air, a not warm enough coat around him. Facing the leader of the RFP security team, he had assigned to this mission. Though perhaps security team wasn't the best term to describe them, since they were really little more than ill-equipped thugs. They had no qualms about following orders, though, and the Volst had little money to spare, so Pavlov supposed they would have to do. <coughs> have the preparations been made? Yes, sir. Our men are positioned all around the warehouse, ready to begin the attack on your command. Pavlov nodded at that, looking over the warehouse with a smile that many in his life described as unsettling. He understood why perfectly well. He enjoyed his job to an extent that most wouldn't consider normal, and he never once felt the slightest hesitation about ordering lives to be snuffed out like candles at night. No, he understood, all right. He just didn't care. Anything for fascism, no matter what, it involved. Fire at will and take no quarter. The stench of sweat, the fear of degenerates incapable of standing up for themselves. Another early morning break-in, another communist spy in the Harbin community seized from his kin. The Japanese paid good money for live detainees. The men of the RFP didn't care what their masters wanted the prisoners for, only that the money was good. Every disappeared Bolshevik trash meant more guns, more weapons, everything for the National Revolution. Petlin's uniform was crisp, proper. He savored the occasion, the moment, the instant, where the hope of escape died in each prisoner's eyes. Some resisted until they turned over to the Japanese, but most of the, of the rest eventually gave in. Empty eyes for human shells, afraid, cowering, their lives in Petlin's hands. It felt good to be Brzezewski's point man. He was judge and arbiter. He would find all that disobeyed the Russian fe- No! <sighs> he awoke, trenched in sweat. <sighs> he'd, only, he'd never gone and helped in the kidnappings. He'd, he'd only heard rumors. <sighs> only... Petlin sat on his bed. Lydia gone. Probably the restroom. Heart beating. Memories of Harbin faded and vivid in his mind. He had known. The RFP's worst thugs, Petlin, had known what they were up to. He had done nothing, mainly out of apathy. 
He had believed back then. He thought the Thaws could do no wrong. Petlin knew he shared in the guilt. He stood, shook his head. <sighs> Perhaps he could not atone. And yet he had to try. A past only half buried. So yeah, this guy is the second guy you can take over. Third... I, third I've talked about, second in like a normal like ability, probability. Um, and I don't know why I'm being kind of vague. Ooh, Spear, wunderbar. Uh, but yeah, we're going with this guy. Uh, we're going with Petlin. Because I don't think I've ever, I've seen anyone do a Petlin YouTube, ser uh, YouTube series yet. And a lot of my, uh, people on my Discord and stuff like that, comment section, I don't think they've said they've seen one either so i figure you know what let's let's show mr petlin some love so we're gonna start up with some siberian factories magadan as has been noted before is remote and isolated from the rest of russia the poor town of magadan itself the industry that exists is small and not particularly tailored to the production of war material Fortunately, in the Far East, this lack of industry persists everywhere, as the industrial center of Vladivostok, developed in the time of the Reds, is now lost to the Japanese and Manchurians. To put it briefly, all who we fight in the East are now on a level playing ground. No opportunity pass passes Matkovsky by, however. From the wastes of Siberia, he shall craft factories with the express intent of waging war, not small-time conflicts between soldiers. The party shall arm and train the soldiers of Magadan as soldiers, not bandits possessing a, a higher ideal. Additionally, no citizen sheltering under the wings of the party shall know poverty or lack. Let this be an example, a vision of Russia to come. Here we go. What do we want to do here? We could raid a more. We could do one of these as well. Let's do an industrial investment. Anyway. <laughs> Mikhail Mutolkovsky stood, overlooking a large map of Magadan and its hinterland in the conference room that he and his top advisors often met in. He sighed, taking in the reality of his situation. While Magadan was a real town, most of the territory he controlled was either depopulated, underdeveloped, or both. It wasn't exactly an ideal situation for a government that needed bodies and industry as fast as possible. As a number of his ministers filed in, all of them presumably having been briefed on the nature of the meeting, Mankovsky turned to them. In his well-known, tactful manner, he addressed his audience. It's clear that our current industrial situation is untenable. Continuing, moving aside to show his ministers a map. We need to take action to ensure that we're not overwhelmed by our southern rivals. It's no secret that they enjoy J Japan's material support. One minister, Golstov, spoke up. It'll take some work, of course, but I have been thinking the same thing. We cannot allow ourselves to be outcompeted by our rivals. A few proposals can be drawn up, my boss. Industrialization under the direct supervision of the government, attracting any potential foreign investment by any means necessary. Mankovsky looked around, waiting for any of her comments before continuing. Good, please do. I don't plan on matching Brzezewski and the Whites. I want to outstrip their production. Tacit nods from most followed. Mankovsky made his intentions clear. He wanted to turn Magadan into a city of industry. Not an easy task, certainly, for Magadan's earliest purpose was as a stop-off for the work camps and mines in the region. But if Avost thought it best, it was probably best. And every person in the room, Mikulski included, knew that if Avost wanted it, it would be done. Mikulski nodded gently before stating, Well then, let's get to work. And we have our work cut out for us, don't we? Good old Siberian factories, and then we'll get to Siberian farms soon enough. A boat has arrived from Kamchatka carrying an interesting passenger, an American tourist. People do not usually come to visit Russia from the outside, especially Americans. After all, no one likes visiting war-torn wastelands, especially the spread out and frigid Far East. It probably won't even last a week without freezing to death unless we help him out somehow. We cannot let a naive American die in the wilderness. The least we can do is provide them shelter for a few days. 
Perhaps Minkowski could even meet with him. Being an American, he could always be useful for reaching the leadership of the United States. We have always wanted a closer, closer relationship with the Americans, so why not start now, when we have one right here? Minkowski even believes he has connections to the CIA. What fortune! Besides, it would be a good way to show hospitality. The American ought to be impressed when he meets the true Vols of the Russians. No matter what, it would make a good impression. What will help us stand out besides all the other warlords surrounding us. However, maybe it could be a better and safer idea just to give him a general tour around Magadan. Letting him see the town will show him the true way of life in Russia better than any meeting with Mikulski. Besides, Vols is a busy man, and he may not enjoy wasting his time with a potentially worthless American. So, should we give him a tour of a town, or should Mikulski invite him to a drink? You know what? Send, send him to Mikulski. Find the best vodka we have. We're doing this. Oh, beautiful. We can get training some new stuff. What really needs addressing? Um, our literacy rate needs to be counteracted already. I can tell you that much. Industrial equipment's fine. I'm going to work on building new schools. Yeah, that'll work. <clears throat> I had a meeting with Magadan's Voz today, Mikhail Mikulski. He seemed pretty funny and offered some almost not awful vodka, but overall the experience was rather strange. He kept asking me about my connections to President Nixon and the CIA, weirdly enough. Maybe it's my hair? After I told him I was just an average American, he seemed a little disappointed. Then he asked about how life was in America and what I was doing in Russia. I told him I was a university student back home and I had come to visit so I could explore Russia and maybe have a little bit of fun and adventure instead of my boring life back home. I don't know what he said after that, but I think it was something along the lines of how I'll be shot by the first bandit that gets anywhere near me, so... Oh well. <sighs> then I had a few more drinks and proceeded to tell him my dad was an astronaut in a secret mission on Venus. As well as back in the war, he had killed over 100 Japs, with only a pistol. In reality, he's a mechanic and always has been, but Golfiki seemed to enjoy my story, however. Although I don't know how much of it he understood, my, my Russian isn't the best. After our meeting, he gifted me this enormous bearskin. I, I guess I should wear it? I think I, I already think I'm fine with that, without it, as I already have my own fur coat, but I accepted it anyway. It is very warm. Next, I'll be heading up to Yatkuts to see what's going on there. Well, at least he had fun. Eh, sounds like it. You know what he reminds me of? He reminds me of, uh... Steve reminds me of, what's his name? Um, Bald and Bankrupt. That, that YouTuber guy who goes to, like, the middle of fucking obscure towns in Russia. Like, um, he went to Rykov and... We know it is Vyatka, but it's not in Russia, it's Rikov, Siktiv Kar, just random places in Russia, um, here in, like, Dagestan, um, just all over the world and just kind of, like, talks to random people, hitchhikes all over the place, doesn't realize how he could be fucking murdered any time. But he kind of reminds me of that, uh, the bald and bankrupt guy. But yeah, um, I don't have anything else. The trader parked, surrounded by thugs from the Russian fascist party, their uniforms brown against the setting sun, visible in the distance beyond the display windows. They had ransacked his shop, trinkets lay on the ground, and what little cash he had scrounged and wrung out of the trader's pockets lay on the counter. The shop had seen better days, days the trader could remember with fondness, fondness and warmth. The union wasn't perfect, but at least they had not hired overgrown children to boss around people, boss people around in fascist uniforms. One of the little fascists, a scrawny little man with a fro voice frozen in permanent hysteria, thumped on the counter, sending the few coins on to it, on it into tremors. To his face, his fellow thugs called him Vlad, the boss. Behind him, they ridiculed his height and his voice and whispered rumors of him knowing some important figures in the pol Ar Artie's political wing. I know you got more, some more, he said. Come on, Bogdan. 
for our old friendship. You don't want to have all you ever had destroyed. Do you? I'm patient, but my friends here are not. I keep begging them, but they wouldn't leave you alone. I beg you. I beg you. Fulfill their simple wishes and pay. Once you pay up, I'll have your back again. Bogdan didn't have anything else. Business had been slow since the fall of a union, and chaos wasn't exactly great for commerce. He hung on to his shop with a kind of stubborn nostalgia, dreaming that the old times might return. He turned to his office to address his tormentors. <sighs> Wait a moment. Kneeling behind his desk, he found his family safe and unlocked it. A gun and his late wife's jewelry. His hand inched towards a pistol, but he stopped mid-motion. Not today, not wise. So he took her wedding ring and handed it to Vlad. <laughs> I am so glad that you decided to relent. After all, you're one of our favorite customers. <sighs> Till later, Vlad. That guy's not very nice. So we got our Siberian factories. Next, we'll go ahead and get working on some Siberian farms. As a famous Chinese strategist once said, an army marches not on its feet, but on its stomach. The port town of Magadan has always relied on outside imports during the time of the accursed Union and Empire to sustain its need for food. Deprived of connections to other regions of the motherland, most of its inhabitants have turned to coastal fishing to make do in the meantime. A secret wish spreads in their hearts, born out of hunger. For Russia to save them. The party and Mikovsky with it shall he heed their calls. The uh, officials will gather support and conscripts to work in the fields of Siberia. The Far East is not fertile, but an effort from an honest Russian will be all it takes to create a miracle. We do not need our storehouses to be filled with food overflowing, just enough to survive the harsh climate of Siberia and feed our people. When Russia rises again, all these will be forgotten, like ashes in the wind. How's our industrial investments coming? Not bad, not bad. Hmm. Beacon. Still not used to most of his music, so I'm I'm still cat I'm I'm getting used to it and I'm digging it, I gotta say. And Jiang versus the PRC. We'll see what happens there. <clears throat> Katarina saw her father sit down at the entrance of their house, oblivious to her presence. She found him clutching his temples as if a hair-splitting headache was tearing him apart. It wasn't the first time she noticed that her father tended to linger outside for a bit before entering her, their house. Now, as the sun was setting, its orange light aged his features beyond the man's already formidable years. He joined the party since its first days in Arbin and was a veteran of the anti-Bolshevik front. People from inside the party, further up, the Nyarki called her father Vlad the Tall in mockery of his height. Outside the party, they called him a thug, a criminal, a robber vested with an RFP uniform. Sometimes you could see his reputation manifest itself when he met the neighbors. Small business owners, shopkeepers, and the fishermen of the port looked at him with a mix of fear, reprehension, and disgust. Any time any of them dared to cross Vlad's path, however, they scurried away almost immediately when he drew his gun, a trusty Nambu, that he had kept by his side for years, again, since the days of Harbin. In Katarina's eyes, however, she did not find a monster in the figure of her father, standing as a silhouette against the dying day. He felt his mask lasp, lapse and vanish every time he spoke a word to her. The icy and reversed, aloof, harsh, and cold attitude melted, revealing beneath them, if not a decent man, the husk of one. She ran out of the door and caught her father's hand, surprising him. It's dinner time, she said, a smile across her face and words. Get in! An image of a man painted in different shades. Hmm. You might want to try something else then. That's what I'm thinking. When 
With the founding of the Siberian factories and farms, the party in Magadan has established itself as a force capable of action and reform. Unfortunately, these acts have only had limited success so far. As hard as it is for Metkovsky and his political clique to admit it, time will only tell as to the efficiency of these efforts. For now, we can only wait. In the meantime, there is the matter of the armed forces of the party. They're not ca though capable and relatively well armed, our men are not suited for or used to the fighting in the far north. It's time to try something else. Metkovsky, a soldier himself in an age long past, shall observe as his generals and officers forge from the soldiers of a new army of hardened and experienced men capable of fighting in the tumultuous weather of Siberia. Drills, drills will be a regular occurrence, whether in harsh or clear conditions. Every soldier of Magadan shall be the spearhead of Metkovsky's crusade. There we go. I'm figure it out. Hmm. <sighs> Looks like Yagoda is managing here so far. What about wholesome Keanu Reeves, man? What is he doing? Hanging in there, somewhat. <clears throat> Mikhail Minkowski, the Volst himself, made his way down to the Mangadon garrison to inspect the quality of the troops that made up his army. The chilly morning air seemed not to have any effect on the Volst, who was in full military dress as he and his high command approached the troops in formation. All the soldiers were dressed as he was and sported their weapons of war, but even before he approached them, Minkowski could tell what poor soldiers they would make. His generals exchanged nervous glances with one another. One soldier was too fat, the other malnourished. The third was too short, and the fourth didn't have his uniform buttons done upright. They all had full uniform, but it seemed as if they had simply borrowed bits and pieces from their peers, as a lot of them didn't fit. All of them, not just these four, were, were equipped with weapons that looked like they had been outdated by the time the Germans were ravaging the west of Russia. This sorry state of affairs made it blatantly obvious to Mikovsky that on one of the most important days of their lives, these troops could barely muster together even the smallest shred of professionalism. The inspection ended, Minkowski politely walked around the columns of the Magadan garrison, taking mental notes. Scruffy beards, outdated weapons, ill discipline. Minkowski knew it wasn't their fault, for the most part. He had a chronic shortage of bodies, weapons, and officers, all of which were necessary for raising and maintaining a professional army. After the inspection, he had called a meeting of his high command, where a rare flare of anger shone through his usual professional behavior. <sighs> what is going on? These are the best troops you have to offer me, he asked his generals. A number of cursory excuses were offered, but Nikovsky put his hands up to demand their silence. I don't want to hear it. If those are the men who guard the capital, what do those on the front lines look like? How do you think we will overcome Wodzewski, let alone retake the entirety of Russia? I don't care what the solution is. I want you to find it. And I want it to be want it I and I want to be briefed on it this time tomorrow. Oh, come on, it's it's not that bad. Well, we might want to do some preliminary arming then. The time has come. For the Siberian factories we built to bear fruit. With enough workers to staff their floors and sufficient machinery, they can begin to operate as intended. From the streets of Magadan, these factories' chimneys can be seen churning out smoke, a hint of the things they create within. Rifles, uniforms, bullets, even artillery guns, and shells lurk inside most of them. The party has triumphed against the most in the most desperate situations, and Mikulovsky is pleased. It's time to honor the militant wing of the party. With adequate equipment, our soldiers will stand to fight the Reds, the Tsarist, or Rudzevsky with much greater strength, even if it is a mistake to underestimate them so early. This advantage will afford us the opportunity we need to unify the Far East, and Mikulovsky gears up for a crusade to liberate the motherland from the clutches of suffering and disunity. There we go. 
Go ahead and scavenge for loot. <clears throat> it all started with a game of cards in a bar. Alexi's joint. Just down the street from the Port of Magadan. There, a couple locals, their names blurring on the party report sheet, were playing blackjack. The gamble was over a couple of drinks and several hundred ruples. Nothing big, but nothing small. They expected the night to go on as smoothly as it always did, a cruise into the moonlight as the games continued, pockets emptying, and men filling the streets with the grace of drunken feet. Three listless men entered into the bar, new arrivals in Magadan. They were Rebel's men, heavily armed and heartily paid, professional soldiers that hailed from all corners of the world. They had too much free time. At first, they and the locals got along quite nicely, which is to say they didn't interact much at all. Only silent nods and scarce eye contact bridged the difference between the groups. The uneasy truce did not last long. The listless men flirted with the girls behind the counter. The locals did not like it. Standing up, they shouted profanities at the mercenaries in a language they did not understand. It did not take long for the soldiers to unholster their pistols and threaten the locals. It took only a minute before one of the mercenaries accidentally fired a shot, resulting in a dead civilian who was only found hours later after the rioting that had ensued. The locals, instead of being driven back by gunshots, charged your men, using broken bottles and chairs to attack the new arrivals. Rebels mercenaries, dispatched as backup for the new arrivals, got involved shortly. The party's police, who intervened to stop more bloodshed, were met with a rain of bullets and jagged glass. After a dozen dead civilians and two dozen more wounded, the riots were finally put down by force. The free mercenaries were immediately tried and sentenced. The party's police, for their part, did their job after two hours. A premonition, perhaps. Spooky. Let's invest in some infrastructure. I mean, our construction is not coming along that no I, Although we, we got three factories. I'm guessing we got uh, the uh, off screen one. Preliminary arming, there we go. Let's go ahead and acquire some advisors. The lands of Siberia have a long history. Even before the time of the Empire's rapid expansion, eastward in past centuries, various peoples have dwelled here, enduring the harsh weather and making a living from it. The troops of Magadan have much to learn from them, and their advice on surviving in the wild can mean the difference between life and death in the unrelenting conditions of the Far East. To acquire these advisors, some troops along with local interpreters will travel north to the land surrounding Kamchatka. There, we will establish connect contacts with the natives in hopes of using their millennia of experience to aid the development of our own theory of warfare. We shall more mold our soldiers into survivors, into victors. No longer shall they survive in the Siberian wilds by the skin of their teeth. From now on, they shall live with neither doubt nor concern given to the gods of the far eastern lands. There we go. Now that works for me. Do we want to train our troops, get another little bit more manpower? Honestly, yeah, let's do that. That sounds good to me. <clears throat> On the surface, Sergei Dmitrovich Solyovyanov was not a dangerous man to the RFP. His printing press followed all the party's guidelines and regulations, and he lent them his businesses from time to time to print propaganda. However, on nights like these, with the moon nowhere in sight and unaccompanied by a single oil lamp, he let his facade drop. He unscrewed his flask and drank some terrible vodka he had saved from local distillery. <sighs> Wretched stuff, but there was nothing better. The party took the cream of the crop for themselves. He returned to his desk, his figure throwing in all directions. Sergei was in his office, in his element. He considered it lighting up a cigarette while he worked, but decided against it. Sitting down, he glanced at the pamphlets he had written. Satisfied as it was work. Soon, the garbage collection detail would come and collect its pieces, distributing them among the streets of Magadan. He paid them a small sum to keep quiet about it. Leaning down, Sergei almost dozed off before thought kicked in his skull. Why did he do this? 
resistance to the party was minuscule, and his men were more loyal to his money than anything else he could offer. He looked at his oil lamp, its fuel running low, a single candle holding out against a backdrop of darkness. The symbolism was not lost on Sergei. Perhaps in a few days, a few weeks, maybe even a year, he would find himself in a basement, moments away from being snuffed out. He would aside his warriors. A knock sounded. Sergei stood to answer it. Embers of past age. I think with that, actually, I'll go and decide what we're gonna invest real quick. Early artillery. Yeah, that works. I'm gonna cut it here, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you as always for watching. However, if you like this video, leave a like. If not, feel free to dislike. If you want to see more of this content in the future, go ahead and hit the sub button for more uploads every weekday, as well as every Saturday. If you have any comments, feedback, concerns, anything of the sort, leave in the comments section below. I read all the comments I get and appreciate any of the feedback you might have for me. If you want to chat, play games, anything of the sort, check out my uh, my Discord down link below. If you want to send a few bucks my way, I have a, a Patreon. You can check that out. And if you want to see me do do this sort of stuff live, I have a Twitch, all of which are down in the description box below. That's really it for now, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you as always for watching. My name has been Dogwell333. I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.